All right, so um, my name is Sonny Scroggin, um, Scroggs son on the internet, uh, and uh, this is taking elixir to the metal. So apparently, one of my coworkers, when he heard this uh, talk title, thought that it was going to be about elixir and like music, like metal, um, <clears throat> and and it and it actually was, but Johnny forgot to bring the drum set back here, so. Um, so it's actually going to be a different talk. Uh, so this talk is uh, about elixir, right? Um, and as we as we all know and love, elixir is a dynamic functional programming language. Uh, it's built for scalability and all that good stuff that we've we've heard about already in this conference. Um, it's known for this like trinity of features like concurrency, fault tolerance, and distribution. And it's, you know, built on top of this rock solid, awesome thing. Uh, but one thing that I think a lot of people don't really understand when they first start learning Erlang and Elixir is that this thing is like the ultimate orchestration platform. Um, you know, there, it, it allows you to build systems that uh, you don't need to build everything in Erlang or Elixir and have it available, you know, inside your, your code. So it can talk to the outside world. And you can also build supervision trees that actually support, uh, you know, spawning processes, like external systems. Maybe you have like a Python script that you need to run and uh, because that code's already stable and doing what it needs to do. Um, but you can write it in Erlang so that it actually starts that process and has a port communication. And if that, pro if that process dies, then you can actually supervise it and have it restart and, and do whatever. So, um, so actually, Erlang was originally built for telecom. And believe it or not, like you have to deal with hardware and, and stuff in telecom. And so all of these features are built in to this runtime system that we, that we know and love. And so there's various ways that you can do this. Um, and so you can use ports. Um, there's this thing called URL interface, which is really interesting. And there's also a, a thing called J interface, like if you want to do Java, which I don't know why you would. Um, there's this thing called C nodes, which is really, really cool. So you can actually build um, external systems that use the Erlang distribution uh, like protocol to act like, Erl like an Erlang node. And you can like send messages to it and it can send messages back. Etc. But it's like an external system. Um, there's this thing called port drivers as well, which is um, there's uh, a lot of the internals and stuff of, of various things are built with port drivers. Um, and then there's this thing called native implemented functions or NIFs. And um, some integration examples. Um, there's uh, Mix uses ports to like when you have like git dependencies for instance it's going to use a port to actually like reach out to to the uh the git binary on your system uh erlang's inet driver is uh a port driver for all the networking stuff that that happens within the beam so like tcp udp all that stuff it's written in c it's really really fast um and then there's also this uh nif called jiffy and it's a json encoding and decoding library uh, and so it's really, really fast. So if you're using like Poison or whatever, um, if you want to have like a really fast NIF or a really fast JSON encoder, then you can use Jiffy and it's written in C and it's really fast. So NIFs, uh, that's basically what this talk is going to be about. Um, we have, it stands for Native Implemented Functions. Um, they're usually implemented in C or C++ sometimes. And of course they're, because of that, it, it's reserved for wizards, you know, these people that actually know what they're doing. Um, why the hell would you want to write an if uh, in that case? So uh, Erlang's fast, but it's not, it's not that fast, right? Um, it was not really designed for raw CPU throughput. Uh, it was designed for this fault tolerant system and uh, giving you um, a lot, it's a lot more about how to build fault tolerant systems uh, versus speed, right? And so um, you'll write a, want to write an if if you have to talk directly to hardware, 
for instance, since you can't really do that directly in Erlang. Um, maybe you need to interop with some graphics library or whatever. Or maybe the functionality that you need already exists in some C code and you just want to pull that in because it's, it would take much longer to rebuild everything in, in Erlang or Elixir. So the one thing that, uh, don't try to read all this because it's really tiny, but uh, when you get into NIFS, you're gonna, you're gonna read this warning when you actually look at the documentation. And it's like, basically like, the first rule of NIFS is like, don't write NIFS because they're, they're like, there's, there's things that you have to actually know, otherwise you can cause catastrophic failure throughout your entire system. So, uh, which is bad, especially since we're running on the beam because we have these fault tolerant uh, guarantees and things like that. So, um, NIFS themselves, they're called just like any other Erlang and Elixir code. You have a module, call a function, and instead of calling the normal bytecode that would be running inside of that module or in that function, it's gonna actually reach out and load some native code and, and run that. So NIFs live in dynamic loaded libraries, so depending on your, your operating system, it's gonna be like a, a shared object, .so, or a, a DLL if you're on Windows. Um, and NIFs end up, what, the, what happens is, is they actually replace um, the normal Erlang bytecode with this native code at, at, when, the, when the module's being loaded into the, to, to the runtime. So NIF functionality, essentially it can read and write Erlang terms, um, things like binaries. Uh, there's this really cool thing called resource objects that I'll talk about. And then you can also do like native threads and, and concurrency as well. <clears throat> um, this is kind of how you would set up a NIF in Elixir. So if we were creating a JSON library, uh, there's this module attribute called onload, and it takes an, an atom of, of a function that it's gonna call. So it takes zero arity. So we have this uh, init function, we're gonna call that, and this we're just going to use uh, like the code priv to find the path to our, our actual like dynamic load, or dynamic library. And then we call Erlang load nif, and that will actually then do all of the, the replacement and stuff. And then, so these functions here that we have, uh, we just return errors. Um, you can also provide like the fallback actual implementation of these functions if you want. So if you wanna like pull in poison or whatever and just have it call it if, it, if for some reason it can't actually load the, the native module. Um, but otherwise you just return an error if something bad happens. So here's the structure of a NIF and C. Yay, C. All right, so Erlang provides a, uh, a NIF API, and you can pull this in with the erlnif.h, um, and then you just basically have to implement all your functions, which they all have the same structure. So it takes an erlenv uh, as the first argument. We have uh, a count of how many arguments are being called, so basically the arity of the function. And then we have uh, all of the actual terms, the Erlang terms that are being passed into the function, and it's just a vector of, of Erlang terms, and then we just need to return an, an Erlang term. Um, this Erl end thing, it's, uh, it's basically, it's passed as the first argument. Um, it represents an environment that ho hosts uh, Erlang terms, and uh, cont also contains transient information about the calling process, so uh, the, I mean, everything that happens in Erlang happens in a process, so if you, every time you call a function, the caller of that function gets passed in as kind of a contextual information about the calling process, in, and it's available inside the NIF, um, or available inside the environment. Um, all terms that are be basically belong to this environment, they're destructed when the environment is, goes away. And it's really, it's an opaque type, so you can't really do anything with it other than just like pass it into the, the Erlang uh, NIF APIs. Uh, similarly, the Erlang NIF term, it's an opaque type, just kind of represents the, the Erlang term in C, and it belongs to this environment that's passed in as well. Um, so the next thing we have to do is we have this uh, Erl NIF func type, and what that does is it allows us to uh, return like a list of structs uh, that represent 
the NIF on both the Erlang side and the C side. So we have the first uh, thing in the struct is a, like a string representing the function that's in our Erlang module or Elixir module. Then we have the arity, and then we have like a pointer to the function that actually is gonna do the work in C. And then we have the final thing we need to do, which is to kind of initialize everything. And this, we tell it, hey, this is the module uh, that you're gonna attach yourself to. Here's the list of all the functions that we have. And then there's like, these nulls are a bunch of other things that we don't care about, like how, how are you going to um, handle reloading and loading and, and various other things, so. Um, but obviously, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know it C very well at all. Um, I would never trust myself to write C, uh, even if my life depended on it. So um, that brings us to Rust. So Rust is a systems programming language uh, that's built by Mozilla, and it's a really, really amazing, awesome language. It's like a high-level, low-level language. Um, so. It's blazingly fast. Um, a lot of function, you know, the people are writing, rewriting a lot of C programs that are notoriously uh, like security prone, like for bugs and stuff, and trying to make things more secure. And um, because of the way that Rust works, uh, it allows you to build programs that won't compile unless they are actually safe and. Uh, like basically just removes whole classes of these bugs that we, we see that cause all these security vulnerabilities and things. Um, and not only that, but obviously like programs that crash at runtime. So um, Rust has a lot of guarantees uh, for fault tolerance and safety and, and these things, uh, which is really, really awesome. So, um, so some of these accolades that it boasts on its website, um, so zero cost abstractions. There's this uh, really cool like trait-based generics that they have um, that allow you to kind of, it's kind of gives you this like object-oriented feel, but it's it's not object-oriented, but which is really nice. It actually does have a lot of functional uh, approaches. Um, it's got like monadic types. So if you're like a type nerd and you like Haskell, um, it does have some of the, the stuff that, that Haskell has. Um, but it also has like pattern matching. Um, it also has efficient C bindings. So uh, when I first started learning about Rust, I was really wondering like how it would be so cool if I could write NIFs in Rust instead of C. And so I was thinking, well, if I'm thinking about this, surely someone else is also thinking about this. Um, and so I really wanted to be able to write uh, NIFs in Rust and see how that goes. So. The first library that uh, I came across is called Erlang Nifsys, and it's essentially, it's, it's basically like a, a, a generic binding uh, of, of all of the C API, but it translated into Rust. Um, and so I started like, taking a look at this, and it was like, oh sweet, I, I can totally like write NIFs in, in Rust instead. Um, but the API here, this is like really just like a thin wrapper around, um, around the, the, the Erlang C API. So all the function names are like really like long and C-like, um, and it's very much almost like translating the C API. So you, you still have to like pass around pointers and, and do all these kinds of things. And so it doesn't feel like really like rusty. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just like build a higher level library on top of this, and uh, I ended up coming across this library, which was like, yes, I don't have to write it. That's so awesome. Um, but when I did find this library, um, it wasn't quite uh, compiling on Mac, so I couldn't use it. Um, so I got involved. Uh, I sent a couple pull requests, got it, got it working, got all the Travis CI stuff uh, working and involved, and like within just like a couple of P uh, PRs, the, the maintainer, Hans, uh, was like, well, since somebody else other than me is actually interested in this, why don't, why don't you just, I'll just make you a collaborator and we can like, you know, talk about this stuff. So, um, so you know, basically it was like, all right, sweet. Now I'm gonna actually like submit a talk about this stuff. And so 
I submitted a talk for this, and I actually gave it about a year ago in, in NDC London. And, um, but I was really stressed because literally all the functionality that I wanted to talk about wasn't in this library yet. And so uh, there was like a couple of months where it was just like working hard to like get all these, get all these uh, things available so I could actually talk about them. Um, so Rustler is basically, it's a library for uh, writing NIFs in, in Rust, obviously. Um, it provides uh, you know, facilities for generating the boilerplate uh, that you don't need and uh, interacting with the, the, the Erlang VM. So it handles all the encoding and decoding of Erlang terms to, to Rust types uh, and vice versa. And it also, it catches any panics that you might have in your Rust code and it catches that before it unwinds back into C. And so really the, the reality with that is is that you, using Rustler, you should not be able to crash the beam by, with your NIFs, uh, which is not, you, can, you can't guarantee those types of things uh, with C NIFs. So if you use it incorrectly, uh, you can completely destroy and crash the beam, which is totally sucks. So getting started is really simple. Uh, we actually have a, like a, an Elixir uh, mix task to like generate stuff for you. So you can create a, a mix new JSON. We add Rustler to our dependencies. Um, this is the current version, but the like changes that I'm showing are actually going to be in master. So uh, if you didn't know about this in your depths, you can actually like add this sparse thing that tells it like a directory that you want to use. So also you can use GitHub instead of Git, and you could just do the the username and the the, the library or the repo. Um, so fetch the depths, and then we can use mix rustler .new, and this is going to allow us to like generate our project. So we tell it a module name, which is, which is JSON, and it's going to go ahead and generate a bunch of stuff for us. Um, we can also like specify here uh, that we want our our, li our library name, like our NIF, to be called fast JSON. So then you can add the Rustler compiler to the list of compilers in your project. And then we have this Rustler crates uh, configuration here, which allows us to specify, you know, all the different NIFs that we have in our project. So we tell it the path, and then we can tell it like what mode we want Rust to be compiled in. So depending on if it's if we're in, in if we're in production, then we want it to be like compiled in Rust for production, which make it faster. Um, otherwise, we'll just use debug so that that it's uh, faster to to compile. Um, so this module that we wrote before uh, with Rustler pulled in, it shrinks down to just this. So you just use Rustler and then it goes, goes ahead and generates the init function for you and, and all that kind of stuff. So this is what our librs file looks like. So we have, um, we have a couple of extern crates that we pull in. These are like external packages outside of the uh, of the crates system in, in Rust. So we pull in Rust, Rustler, um, we pull in this thing called lazy static, um, which allows us to like have atoms that are statically created and, and all that kind of stuff. And then we have uh, extern crate JSON. So I'm like pulling in an existing JSON parsing library that's already fast in Rust. And then we have like a couple of uh, modules. So we have a decoder module and we have an atoms module. Um, and the, the atoms module is just simply like our atoms that we're going to be using with inside of our NIF. Um, so like, you know, OK and stuff like that. Um, then we have this uh, Rustler export NIFs. So we specify this, the string elixir.json. Um, for those of you new to Elixir, when you compile your module, it always is elixir. Dot, whatever your module name is. Um, and then we give it a list of similar structure as before, where we have the function name uh, inside the module, the arity, and then uh, some function within our Rust code that's going to, to uh, handle that. All right, so let's take a look at the simple approach of just using uh, existing JSON parsing library. Um, so we're just gonna basically take a string, or a big binary, and we're gonna decode that into Rust types, and then we're gonna convert those Rust types into Erlang terms and then return it. So this is the decoder. Um, we're just importing a bunch of stuff. 
and um, we have our decode function, which is gonna take the environment as the first argument, and then instead of having the, the, um, the count of arguments and uh, of like a list of, of terms, we just have an args, and it's just a, a basically a slice uh, of, of, of terms. So, and then this returns a result, which is either a term or an error. So, um, in Rust, one of the things that's really, really cool is that, um, that you can't throw exceptions or any of that kind of stuff. You literally just have types that you return. Um, and if you don't return the right types, then it won't compile. So, um, so we don't have to worry about like throwing exceptions all over the place or whatever. Um, we can just use, use uh, results. So here we just uh, fetch the first argument out of the, uh, the terms here. And so we just call decode on it. And this question mark is really, really cool. Um, it's basically like, it, it's, it's a short way of basically saying, hey, do this thing. And if, it's, if it returns a, re a, good, a good thing, if it returns okay, then just like give me the result, uh, the, like unwrapped. Um, but if it's an error, then go ahead and bubble the error up and then the, it's like early return of the error. So, so we get that, we get our data. And then similar to Erlang and Elixir, like a case, uh, we have match. So we pass our data into this JSON parse and it returns either okay and the JSON data structure um, or it returns an error with this error. Um, if we get okay, then we basically uh, call this function called JSON to term. Um, we pass in like stuff, we pass in the environment so that we can use it in there. And then we return, uh, we basically, this is like returning a, uh, the, the tuple of okay as an atom and the term itself. So we're returning basically this like okay tuple. Um, in the case of an error, we just return error and, and give it the error reason. All right, so this is the JSON to term. Um, it's basically just a recursive uh, function that just goes through and, and tries to uh, encode all of the JSON types to Erlang terms. Um, and it handles maps and, and arrays and, and all those different things. So and it just does that in a recursive loop. And then essentially just that's what we return at the end. All right, so let's time our NIF. So we read in some big, big old JSON file. Um, this is like eight, mi eight megabytes of JSON, uh, which I guess is not really that big, but whatever. Um, so we, uh, this, is, this is the way we can actually like time how uh, long it takes to run this thing. Uh, and so we uh, call timer.tc and pass in the uh, module function args, and then we get the time that it takes back. So this is like 1.5 seconds, okay? So I have this like yikes here. Um, most people will be like, whatever, it's just, you know, it takes, takes 1.5 seconds to, to parse that much JSON. Um, and in most languages, that's really, it's fine, right? That's, you just have to deal with it. Like there's a lot of other programming languages that have foreign function interfaces and, and they're dealing with native code. Like in Ruby, there's lots of, like most of the JSON parsing libraries are implemented in C as well. Um, and if you get a big, big file and you have to down, uh, like parse it and it takes a long time, that's just the way it works, right? But in Erlang, it's very different. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna get into kind of the details of why this is and why this you know, simple approach that of using an existing library is really the naive approach. Um, and so when you are first learning about NIFs, um, there's a reason why there's that giant big error and or like warning, and because there's a lot of things that, that can go wrong, and one of them is taking too much time. So um, the part of the warning here is, is that a native function doing lengthy work before uh, returning degrades responsiveness of the VM and can cause miscellaneous strange behaviors. And then this next part feels like one of those like drug commercials, like, you know, <laughs> it's like strange behaviors uh, strange, such strange behaviors include, but are not limited to, extreme memory usage and bad load balancing between schedulers. So um, th this, this is definitely a problem. Um, and really it's so only something that I think that I've 
only ever seen really uh, a, be a problem in, in the Erlang ecosystem. So to understand this, we're gonna take a little quick deep dive into how the, the Erlang VM works uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it. So you have a machine, that machine has a bunch of cores. So let's say we have eight cores. On top of that, you've got your OS and your kernel threads. And then you start your application and it starts and uh, it starts an OS process that basically has uh, the beam running. And then the beam, when it starts up, it also starts up a bunch of its own threads that it uses for various reasons. Um, it starts up eight scheduler threads, uh, one per CPU core. Um, it also has a bunch of other threads for like I.O. and stuff like that. Um, but for the sake of this demonstration, uh, this is the, the problem that we in, in encounter. So each CPU, CPU core has its own scheduler. The job of the schedulers is to schedule processes. So each scheduler has a run queue, and it essentially is like a list of all the processes that, are, uh, that it's uh, handling. And uh, the run queue, it's got all these Erlang processes in it, and it just like goes for each one. It pops the head off, and it runs the process. Uh, runs the bytecode, executes for uh, a given amount of time. So uh, the, the way this works is that uh, because it's running bytecode, uh, the, the VM and the scheduler can actually understand the context of how calls are being made. And so if the thing is just doing like CPU intensive work, um, then it's actually going to only have a limit of what's called 2,000 reductions. And so a reduction is kind of, is like sort of kind of equivalent to a function call, um, but it's not really documented to be like what exactly what it is. So uh, it can vary. I've, I've heard that it can vary depending on the operation, that some, uh, some function calls cost more reductions than others. Also, um, if you use Elixir to wrap Erlang functions just because you want like an, an Elixir API on top, you actually end up causing yourself more reductions, by the way. So, uh, yeah, think about that. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, because we're running bytecode, the, the VM actually understands what, what you're calling. So there are a couple of other, other cases. If, you, uh, if your process uh, is trying to read from the file, file system, um, the, the VM knows that the result is not going to get there right away. So it actually uh, puts your process and schedules you out and puts you into another queue, like the waiting queue. And it will uh, wait for that message to arrive and before it actually puts you back in the queue. And same thing for if you are waiting, receiving a message as well. So, all right, so the other thing that's really important uh, about this is that there's this thing called thread progress. Um, and you can read about it if you go to the Erlang OTP uh, repo and you follow this path here, this Ertz emulator internal doc thread progress. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, uh, write up about how the schedulers like communicate and stuff and why it's really important not to block. So the scheduler threads themselves, this is kind of like just in a, nu uh, a nutshell of how this works, but uh, scheduler threads, like they share some data structures and uh, rather than like protecting them with locks uh, and, or ref counts, uh, which, which tends to be like a cause bottlenecks, um, they essentially like share uh, and, and like they share progress with each other um, and essentially to, they use this knowledge to like know what data structures are actually can be released or garbage collected or whatever. Um, and so I think before they, they, they basically, the, the beam is amazing because they continue to make progress on on making this thing more and more performant, and, and uh, this is just one of the things that uh, they've done that is, is pretty cool. Um, so the, the, the key takeaway here is that you, you don't wanna block the schedulers. Um, you block a scheduler and it prevents thread progress and it makes other schedulers wait. So, and uh, a block scheduler can't run processes, which is a big, uh, which is a big problem. And so a NIF uh, should never take uh, take over the scheduler for more than one millisecond is what the docs say, but obviously you want to return as fast as possible. Um, and the, the problem is, is that reductions are actually not counted for NIFs. So when you, are, when you call a NIF, a reduc the, 
the scheduler has no idea how long it actually is running for. Um, and the, the main problem is, is that if a scheduler is uh, doing this type of thing for a very long time or fre very frequently, the beam will actually start shutting down schedulers uh, because it's actually, um, you know, the, the beam is built for uh, efficiency and even like power efficiency as well. So if it doesn't need all those schedulers, then it'll actually shut them down so you're only running processes on like two schedulers or whatever. So that can be a really big problem. And in fact, um, the folks at React, uh, the, the database, um, they ran into a lot of problems at scale um, because they were running a lot of NIFs and, uh, and also some other things as well. So it actually, uh, some customers were, were seeing like what they call scheduler collapse. Um, and it took them a while to figure out this bug, so. All right, so we need to count reductions. Uh, so we need a way to do that in our function. And so this is how you do it. Um, you can get pro like process.info, you can ask how many reductions you have, and um, we can then call the function. We can do some timing differences and like count the reductions as well and then send it back to the process. Um, interesting stuff. Okay, so when we count reductions here, we can see that running this, it only, uh, it only counted 10 reductions. And this is like way lower than it should have been. All right, so how can we do this better? One option is chunking. Um, chunking is actually kind of hard for most problems, because, especially like JSON parsing. You have to do it very iteratively, and then you also have to be able to preempt yourself and like return back at any given moment. So it takes a lot, it's a lot more work, uh, which required me to actually build my own hand-rolled JSON parser um, in, or, in order to do this. So the way that you do this is uh, you now have a, we have a function called decode, we get the data, and then we call uh, a function called decode init, and decode init is our NIF, and we pass the result of that to this decode result. And depending on what the NIF returns, did I actually do, yeah, okay. So depending on the, the, the return values, we can like chunk and like continually call uh, the NIF over and over again. And we actually have two NIFs now. We have decode init, which like initializes the thing, and then we have decode iter, which is like iterative, like an iterator. So, and that's the one we actually call um, over and over and over again. So if our, if our NIF returns more, and this thing called a resource, and then an accumulator, then we'll just essentially like call uh, this decode iter uh, recursively over and over again. Um, and then we'll also call decode result as well. Um, so this brings us to this thing called resources. So there's a, a thing called resource objects, and it's essentially it's like a smart pointer, um, and it's like a, a safe pointer into some data structure that's inside the beam um, that you can't really use it, it's really, it's opaque. And if you actually like IO inspect the thing, it's just an empty binary. Uh, so you can't, can't use it, but it essentially is this thing that you can pass around uh, back and forth between Erlang and your NIF, and it keeps track of all these various things, like you know terms and, and all that kind of stuff. So it can be, uh, another thing that's really interesting about this is that you can actually pass it to multiple processes, so you could, you could, <laughs> you could essentially like build a like global mutable state thing that multiple processes can actually use at the same time, uh, which gets us into a couple of things that's interesting. Uh, but these resource objects, they're not deallocated until there are no processes that have, are holding on to this value. So, uh, so once, once the pr last process is no longer using it, it gets garbage collected and then it's removed. Um, so this is now our updated libRS, and we basically now have um, this parser, and we also have a sync. The sync is where we just like throw all these already like encoded terms. Um, and let's see, so we now have decode init, which takes two arguments, um, and then we have decode iter, which is the same type of thing. We also have this, um, this last thing is uh, 
is what we want to do on load. So on the previous one, we had none there because we didn't have to really do anything extra. But on this one, we actually have to do some work. So when the, when the NIF loads for the first time, it's going to call this load function. And this takes an environment and allows us to do, uh, like initialize this resource. So we say resource struct init, and we pass in our type, which is our parser resource here, and then um, we're good to go. And then we just return true. So, um, so here in our decode init, we have the same uh, structure as before. Uh, we get the environment and all that kind of stuff. And we also have our parser resource, and it actually has a mutex of, the, of our parser. And the reason why we have to have the mutex is the same reason why I said you can actually pass resources around in multiple processes. And so Rustler protects you against that by making you actually wrap it in a mutex. Um, because if you did have two processes that were trying to access the resource at the same time, if they were scheduled on two different schedulers at the same time and they were both trying to access the resource at the same time, this gives you a way to like lock it and make sure that that, you, that doesn't happen. And this won't compile at all unless you use a mutex, which is really cool. Um, so sim similar to before, we grab the, uh, the source, um, the data. Um, we get our resource uh, by creating a new one. And we have this like resource arc, which is atomic reference counter. Um, we pass in our parser resource with a, with a mutex with our parser uh, that has the source. And that, of course, is going to like go through and um, eventually it's going to parse, parse stuff. Um, but next, we create a vector of terms. And it's just an empty vector right now. And then we call our decode iter nif. Um, so we call our decode iter nif, and we actually pass in the environment. And then we pass in our vector of the resource and the vector, uh, or, and, and then our, in our empty vector. And these are pushed in as terms. Um, and so this is so that we can, like, initially get called, and then we immediately like call ourselves so that we can, so that we can chunk it. So decode iter, um, we actually pull the resource out. Um, we create a vector of uh, terms, or, or we, get our, we get our vector of terms. Um, we call it the sync stack. And then uh, we create the, uh, the term sync. And we actually just like try to parse. So then we, we do resource dot zero uh, dot try lock. This is going to give this is going to like get a lock on our mutex. And depending on what that returns, um, we if we if it returns an error, that means that somebody are, somebody else already has the lock. So um, that's probably bad. Uh, so we have to like bail out. Um, and uh, we just return an error. And otherwise, we get this mutex guard and we just return the guard. Um, and we have this uh, while, while loop here. So we have while not uh, consume time slice. Um, and then we pass in like a one here, and which uh, I, I still need to figure out the, the, the best way to, to actually call this function appropriately. Um, you're supposed to be able to like do some math and calculate, approximate your like the amount of time you're going to take or whatever. Um, but this is kind of a way to like actually accumulate um, accumulate reductions uh, in the NIF itself. So it's a, it's kind of a way to just tell tell the VM, hey, I'm actually doing work, and you know, uh, tell me whether or not I need to like bail out. Um, so this thing will return true or false. Uh, and so while it's false, um, uh, we will basically just parse some stuff. So like. We'll just keep calling it over and over again. Uh, and then when we're done, uh, so so if we, if we if we're if we're not done, uh, if this thing returns um, true or whatever, then we have to like return this more uh, tuple here. So we have more, and then our our resource that we're passing back to to, to Elixir, um, and then our current like stack. So it's like an accumulator that we can like pass back in and just keep pushing terms back on. Um, so now let's take a look at this. We can see now that we've run that, and we're now uh, showing that we have uh, like 11,000 reductions now, which is much, much better. All right, so that was cool. Um, there's also another way that you can do this in, in Erlang, and it's called like it's basically rescheduling. 
So you can uh, do some work in, the, in your NIF and then like actually reschedule it in the NIF instead of returning back to Erlang uh, or returning back to your Erlang code. Um, the problem is right now is that the way that the, Erlang, the, the ENIF schedule NIF API works is that we currently don't have a way in Rustler to guarantee that you're going to use it correctly. Um, and so we've decided not to even put it in Rustler at this, at the, at this time. So um, because we can't guarantee at compile time that it's going to be used correctly, we're waiting until we can actually figure out the best way to do that. Um, so, but when you combine, when you combine um, like this, the idea of this, uh, schedule, like rescheduling yourself along with uh, consumed time slice, it allows the chunking to actually be done directly in the NIF, and the NIF itself will be rescheduled rather than like rescheduling it in your process, uh, you know, space or whatever. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of cool. Um, the other thing is threaded NIFs, and this is actually, uh, I think, a really cool way uh, of, of doing NIFs, um, specifically that you call a NIF, and then that NIF basically just spawns a process, or spawns a thread, an operating system thread, to go and do the work, and then when it's done, it can, it can actually send a message to your process uh, with the result. Um, and this way, you end up getting, when your first initial call to the NIF can return, like, immediately. It can return, like, okay or whatever, and then you just sit there in a receive block and wait uh, like this. So, uh, so we have decode threaded now, and uh, similarly, we just get the string out. Uh, we use Rustler thread. We say thread spawn, and we get this. Um, we get um, we get a caller environment here, and then we also get our own environment that we get here. And then we, when we pass, uh, we parse our, our JSON, and we can like basically do this all this work in the thread. So now we've basically pulled back out and pulled this this JSON parsing crate from Rust our, back into our library because it's much faster and a better library uh, than me writing a, or a, a you know a hand par handwritten parser. So um, so once once it's done, we return like the OK uh, and the result of it or an error. Um, but immediately down at the bottom here, we're actually returning just OK. Like OK, cool, we got it. Uh, and then right here, this is kind of like how you would call it in uh, in Elixir. So you would call decode threaded, which is the NIF. It's just going to return OK immediately, and then we just go into a receive block, waiting for the result. So, uh, pretty pretty nifty. And then we can also like you know do some timeout stuff as well if we if we want to. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about is dirty NIFs. Um, so in OTP twenty, uh, they made this like on by default. Uh, for a while, it was experimental, I think, in like OTP 18 or something like that. Um, and so the idea is is that now, uh, not only do you get eight, like if you have eight cores, you get eight scheduler threads. Now you also get eight dirty scheduler threads. And uh, the cool thing is is that these scheduler threads are specifically for like doing lengthy work that you can't guarantee is going to going to not degrade the system. Um, so they don't operate on the normal thread or normal th um, the normal scheduler threads. Um, there's some interesting things too that you can actually schedule your you can schedule your NIF on the dirty scheduler and then you can also have it scheduled on the regular scheduler and you can kind of flip flop and uh, go back and forth or whatever, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the way, the way this works is uh, you pull in uh, scheduler flags here. And when you're exporting your NIFs, you just add an extra argument here to say it's dirty CPU. Um, and there's also dirty I/O as well, and so uh, you can specify that you want your NIF to run on these on these other schedulers instead of um, the uh, the normal one. And um, obviously, even even uh, in the case of doing dirty NIFs, you still actually do really want to try and return as quickly as possible. Because um, if you end up hogging up a bunch of 
uh, CPU time or whatever on the dirty schedulers, it's also still going to eventually start affecting the system. So the, the rule of thumb is that you still always want to have well-behaved NIFs and write them appropriately so that they don't take up too much time on either uh, type of scheduler. Um, so, yeah, with that, um, I'm finished, but this project has been really, really uh, interesting to me. Uh, I don't have a systems programming background or anything like that, so um, it's really gotten me like a lot of ideas that I want to, um, that I just want to like explore and, and try to, you know, get out there and, and also encourage other people to, to explore and, and uh, experiment with things. So uh, some of the ideas that I'm really interested in doing is, is to actually like take a lot of the awesome things that are happening in the Rust community and like maybe an HTTP server, for instance, and, and actually build that so that it is uh, kind of done as a NIF and be much faster and, and more efficient. Um, but obviously there's a lot of stuff that needs to be uh, uh, learned along the way to do that. So, um, but yeah, Rust is awesome, Elixir is awesome, and I think they work really, really well together. So with that, thank you. <laughs>